Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining and welcome to our BioCastis webinar on the role of an immune host response test in sepsis, where we have three uh, exciting speakers who will present some case reports when using septicide rabbits. This session will take 45 minutes. We will take all the questions that you have uh, at the end of the session. And you can see at the right part of your screen that you can use the question box to ask all your questions. Uh, so first of all, um, already in advance, a big thank you to the speakers uh, to make this an exciting session. And then it's now the time to announce the first speaker of today, which is Professor Marek Vass, who is the head of the biology department in Foch Hospital in Suresne in France. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to discuss with you from the results that you can have using uh, septicide rapid. And first of all, I would uh, like to thank the organizer and particularly Julie Gaifas Girodo for her nice invitation. All I would like to give a short presentation of uh, Foch Hospital. It's a private hospital which is located in near Paris. It's a uh, medium size because there is only 500 beds and uh, 19 places for outpatients and we are specialized in solid organ transplantation particularly in bipulmonary lung, trans uh, lung transplantation and we re uh, realized uh, two years ago the first in uterine transplantation in france so uh, the beds are divided in uh, beds for medicine surgery and obstetrics and we have uh, 49 beds of uh, intensive care unit and, and in the emergency department, we have uh, every year more than uh, seven, 70,000 patients who arrived in the emergency department. So we will discuss today from the interest of the septicides rapid. Perhaps I will give you a short presentation of uh, this new test. It's a rapid RNA-based immune host response test. And uh, you can collect uh, blood before on packed blood uh, tubes but now two on EDTR samples, and it's very easy to use. You have only to put the blood into a small cassette and to put the cassette in this platform. And you obtain a result in approximately one hour and it's a probability of sepsis. So you have a score, as it's called, and when the score is between 0 and 5, there is a low risk of sepsis. Whereas when it is above 7.4 till 15, you have a high risk of sepsis and you have a gray zone between 5 and 7.4. So it's divided in four bonds. Four bonds, which is a low risk of sepsis, a bond four is associated with the high risk of sepsis. I will present you two case reports, which uh, can be um, what we have realized in our hospital. The first one in a patient in the oncology ward with a fibrol neutropenia. And the second case in the, was from the patient who arrived in the emergency department with cold. Fibrol neutropenia is defined by a oral temperature about 38.3 or the same temperature about 30 N for one hour, if you consider the definition which are uh, given by the ASCO. And you have a uh, right, different uh, definition uh, given by ESMO, which is sunstain temperature uh, above 38, which must be present for two hours. Two hours. In fact, they are approximately similar. And of course, we have to have a neutrophile count below 0.5 giga per liter or expected to decrease to uh, less than 0.5 within 48 hours. Uh, per wall neutropenia rate is approximately eight cases for male patients in Europe. And the consequence of this uh, pathology is in hospitalization and antibiotic, antibiotic treatments, reducing the intensity or delivering critical chemotherapy treatment, and therefore potentially shortening overall survival and diminishing quality of life of the patients. People neutro neutropenia mortality rate range between 2.6 and 7 for patients with solid tumors and risk factors at uh, be identified for mortality, older age, about uh, uh, above 65 years, lung, cancer, lung cancers versus other solid tumors, the presence of comorbidities, infection, sepsis is one critical 
aspect for the mortality in fibro and metropenia, pneumonia, and admission to intensive care unit. At this time, there are some uh, risk index scores which have been described. The most common was uh, the, the MAST score, and you see that it's uh, based on different uh, sandstorms, and you have different points, and you uh, calculate the sum of the different points to define patients with low risk or high risk of uh, fibrin neutropenia. A more recent uh, score was uh, recently proposed. It's uh, based on less parameters, and you, you can consider three uh, cases, low risk, moderate, or high. But uh, in fact, these uh, scores are too cumbersome to be applied in real life, and the negative predictive value for complication is only 83 patients. Therefore, they are not very useful in routine. So I would give you now an example how can uh, uh, the septicides rapid uh, you, uh, help for a clinical decision and to confirm or rule out the, uh, the hypothesis of a sepsis. The first case was a female which was 47 years old. She had a cervical cancer treated by radiotherapy, brachytherapy, and total hysterectomy, but she was considered in complete remission since 13 months. She was referred to a hospital because of an hemorrhagic stroke, and uh, at the admission, uh, we observed an elevation of BTHTG uh, before CT scan, and in fact, it was due to a cancer relapse with cerebral and hepatic metastasis. Therefore, a chemotherapy with taxol and cisplastinum was begun, and uh, she was in the oncology ward, and in this event, she had fair first favor and uh, a low count of neutrophils, 0.2, but no clinical sign of sepsis. We performed different biological assay, including COVID-19 assay, flu, RSV, which were negative. The different blood culture on implantable venous access port and systemic blood were also negative, and there was uh, no uh, urinary tract infection. Therefore, an antibiotic treatment was uh, begun with piperacillin and tazobactam for seven days. At T28, after the admission in the hospital, uh, there was a reintroduction of the chemotherapy in parallel with GCSF to increase his neutrophil count. And at the beginning of the chemotherapy, she had a neutrophil count of uh, 1.7 giga per liter. But two days after, at D30, her neutrophil count was, uh, was zero. And uh, she had fever at 38.2 tachycardia, anuria, hypotension, and a high level of CRP at 166. So we decided to perform in septicide rapid, the score at, uh, at nine, which corresponds to the bond four, so with a high risk of sepsis. She was immediately admitted in ICU with plasma volix extension, we uh, added amikacin and vancomycin and then cefepimicin to its antibiotic treatment. And two days after, we observed the, the biological, uh, microbiological exam were available. There was an enterococcus fessium in the, uh, in the urine of the patient, which was resistant to the majority of the antibiotic. The other microbiological tests were negative and uh, chemotherapy was discontinued and reintroduced 65 days later. So, as you can see, two days before the result from the microbiological assay, we could consider be sure that the patient uh, was uh, at the sepsis because of this uh, new assay. For the second case, it was from a female, 70 years old. She had a real fibrillation diagnosed three years ago with uh, an hypertensive cardiopathy and dyslipidemia. She was a former smoker, but had stopped tobacco since 10 years. She was living alone, and she, she was uh, obese with a BMI of uh, 33. Because of general deter uh, deterior deterioration of her general condition during the last three days, and a lot of consciousness during the visit of her daughter, she was referred to a hospital. In the emergency department, she is sleepy, the smoke on a scale was 11, but, uh, but 
very rapidly decreased. She had no fever, the blood pressure was in the normal range, heart rate was 60, and she was uh, poly uh, polypneic with 50 breaths per minute. White blood cell was slightly increased with 14.6 uh, gigaperliters with an increase uh, of neutrophils, and CRP was also high. Arterial blood gas show a decrease of partial pressure in oxygen, an increase in the partial, uh, partial pressure in uh, CO2, and the uh, pH was in the normal range. Her chest XA was normal. The brain CT scan did not reveal any ischemic or hemorrhagical stroke, but she needed an orotracheal intubation uh, and the addition of norepinephrine, or, or of norepinephrine because an hemodynamic instabi uh, instability. So, different hypotheses could be drawn, and the hypothesis of uh, sepsis was, of course, considered. So, there are possible, several possibilities. Either a severe lung infection, because she has a respiratory, a respiratory distress, an oxygen desaturation and biological inflammation, but there was an absence of bacteria on sputum exam, and the film array, which is the uh, assay, which is being Bands of the research of the different nucleic acid of different microorganisms was negative. But because of the hypothesis of a severe lung infection, lung infection, a treatment by cefotaxime and spiramelinicin was uh, initiated. Because of the absence of ConsusNet, uh, the possibility of cerebrospinal fluid infection was considered. She had a confused state for several days, but she was, there was an absence of neck stiffness, and the CSF exam was without white blood cells. But, however, they decided to uh, give her amoxicillin and acyclovir. So, other, uh, other uh, exams were also per uh, performed. There was a normal abdomen palpation, absence of skin lesion, the urine exam was negative, and urinary antigen test for streptococcus pneumoniae and legionella were also negative. So the different microbiological exams were negative and uh, we performed a septicide score rapid score which was at 5, 1, 2, indicating a low probability of a sepsis. Therefore, because of the absence of uh, classical uh, marker of sepsis by microbiological assay, there was a discontinuation of antibiotics three days after hospital admission, and on CT scan, uh, on C on CT scan uh, we observed a mass in the pulmonary left upper lobe as well in the adrenal gland, which was a metastasis of a lung cancer. So, in conclusion, Sepsis is frequent and can delay diagnosis initi initiation of effective treatments uh, and are uh, associated with uh, adverse uh, outcome and, out cost, uh, and high cost of treatment. In the uh, 2070s, almost 50 million cases of sepsis were, uh, of sepsis were recorded worldwide and uh, 11 million sepsis related deaths were reported. Unfortunately, the early identification of, sex, of sepsis among patients is challenging because uh, the clinical symptomatology can be very uh, different. Different biological markers have already uh, been desc uh, described, described for the diagnosis of sepsis, such as CRP, procalcitonin, uh, procalcitonin ISIS, monocyte distribution width, with different sensibility and specificity. Septicides rapid is a new test based on the differential expression of two genes, PLA-C8 and PLA-2G7. In case of sepsis, kids could differentiate sepsis from non-infectious infectious systemic inflammation. This test takes less than one hour and can constitute an interesting help to 
confirm or in contrast to our out this diagnostic, as we have seen on these two scale report. And particularly, it can be useful in severe patients with severe co several comorbidities, and when an inflammatory syndrome not clearly related to sepsis is present. In some cases, in patients with high risk of sepsis, however, a second sample collected within the 24 hours show, showing a further increasing sepsis likelihood may strongly support a true sepsis diagnosis. So, sepsis acts rapid can contribute to a better diagnosis and a better use of antibiotics. I would like to thank my colleague, which can uh, help to uh, obtain the different results, and uh, we will meet for questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Vass. Okay, and then I introduce you to the next speaker, Dr. Francois Dupré, who is Associate Professor in Burn ICU at APAP St. Louis, Paris, in France. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Any slides? Not yet. Not yet. So. Mm, not yet. Yes. I, yes. You see it? Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and uh, as you said, yeah, I work in a burn intensive care in Paris. And so I, I try to show you the potential uh, impact in several burn patients of uh, human host response tests uh, to discriminate sepsis uh, in burn patients uh, against uh, uh, sears from uh, uh, non-sepsis origin. Here are my conflict of uh, interest. So just for those who are not familiar with severe burn patient, we define a severe burn patient, uh, a patient with a total uh, body surface area uh, burn above 20 uh, percent and we only take uh, into account a second and third degree, which means that uh, a burn uh, just of the epidermis is not included. It, the burn of the epidermis is a sunburn that you can have uh, every summer when you go to, to the beach and it do, we do, don't take, take it into uh, account. So a uh, few words about the epidemiology. Uh, burn is a frequent uh, pathology. In France it's uh, between 200 uh, and 400,000 patients per year but mostly outpatients. Only 8,000 of them are uh, required hospitalization and uh, on these uh, 8,000 uh, person, only about 400 are severe burn patients uh, who will be hospitalized in ICU, uh, about half in a burn, specialized burn unit and half in a general uh, intensive care unit. So it's uh, the severe burn is, is a quite uh, rare uh, pathology uh, and you're going to see that it's a complicated pathology with, with a lot of, uh, of infections. To understand the, the infectious risk of this patient, uh, I show you a picture of, of uh, one severe burn patient, 45% uh, of total burn surface uh, area, uh, with here almost only deep burn. Uh, and of course, we can understand that if you have 45% of your skin which is burned, uh, it's a uh, it's a big uh, gate for all infectious disease and specifically for bacteria from the environment and from your, your skin. And those patients will develop many infections during their hospitalization. So, of course, they will develop infections and infection can lead to a sepsis uh, if the, the answer of the body is, uh, is uh, not uh, adequate. Because of uh, pathogen-associated molecule, molecular patterns, there will be production of pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines that will lead to uh, immune paresis, sepsis, endothelial, and organ damage, and, uh, and that can lead to uh, organ dysfunction and multiple organ failure and to death. But a burn patient, we can observe the same thing with a trauma patient or after uh, major surgery you have a uh, production of damage associated molecular patterns that will activate uh, the same pathway of pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines and that, that will be able to mimic uh, sepsis and it will be very complicated in some cases to make the difference between uh, uh, sears uh, from non-infectious uh, 
uh, origin to uh, a series from a, from an infectious uh, infectious uh, origin, and it's a real problem in in severe burn patient because the hospitalization in NCU is not a long quiet river. It's a very long hospitalization from the accident to the healing and uh, rehabilitation, sometimes to, to the death, from the uh, initial hypovolemic shock and and, and non-infectious sears. You will have many repeated surgeries with uh, bleeding, sometimes hemorrhagic shock, inflammation, anesthesia, many sepsis, sometimes some thrombotic, thrombotic complications, and uh, all of this can lead to multiple organ failure. And, and, and we need to make the difference between uh, sepsis and, and non-septic sears to avoid unnecessary prescription of uh, antibiotic. To help us, the uh, American Burn Association tried to propose some sepsis criteria in burn patients. And so you have on the left uh, the clinical signs. So you need to have three or more of the following signs to have a suspicion of sepsis. So fever or, or uh, hypothermia, tachycardia, tachypnea, thrombocytopenia, hyperglycemia, and, uh, and uh, inability to tolerate enteral feeding. And on the other side, you need to have a suspicion of infection, which means either a culture positive infection, but uh, we know that the burn skin is uh, very quickly colonized with uh, many bacteria, so we often have a uh, culture positive infection. Uh, or you need to have pathological tissue source identified, but in the uh, ICU patients, specifically in burn patients, there are many potential uh, sources. You have, of course, the skin, which is the first source, but you can have uh, the lung, you can have the catheter, et cetera, et cetera. Or a clinical response to antimicrobial agents, but which means that you already uh, introduce an antimicrobial agents that you want to uh, avoid to avoid the development of, of uh, highly resistant bacteria. So those clinical signs are very unspecific, and you can find them, of course, during sepsis, but also uh, in post-operative period in this patient, or in case of bleeding, or even just the, the burn can. Uh, can give you fever, tachycardia, and, and tachypnea, by example. So we have many situations in this patient mimicking sepsis. We have also many real sepsis. So we have many situations where we we want to to prescribe antibiotic therapy, but if every time we have a suspicion of sepsis, we prescribe it, there will be a development of resistance. Then that will lead to treatment failure and to worse outcome in this patient. So it's really a population where we need a tool to discriminate septic sears from non-septic sears to avoid unnecessary prescription of uh, antibiotic. And uh, in this case, maybe this septicide rapid test could be interesting. Uh, I just remind you how it uh, it works. It uses a transcriptomic technology uh, that uh, look at the expression of two genes, uh, one which is strongly upregulated in sepsis, PLAC8, and the second one which is uh, strongly done regulated in sepsis and uh, the test is going to look at the differences the difference between the the expression of the of both genes and the the higher the delta is between the expression of the two genes and the higher is the probability of sepsis is the slide that you already uh, see in the previous presentation so when you have a small difference of expression between the two genes you are in the first band here and you have a, a low probability of sepsis with a high sensitivity. And, and, and the opposite, when you have a high difference between the expression of, of both genes, you have a high probability of sepsis with a high specificity. And in the middle, you are in the gray zone, uh, as it's very often the situation uh, with biomarker, biomarkers in, a, in, a, in medicine. And so this test has never been evaluated in, in severe burn patients, and that's what we plan to do. Uh, we just, uh, we're going to just start a study using this test in severe burn patients, and we're going to do serial measurements uh, using this test, one at admission to, have a, to know the, the value uh, in severe burn patients who have a SIRS, but we are sure that they are not infected because they are never infected at, at admission. Then we're going to do uh, another one at day four, when we, we start to be far from the initial uh, inflammatory uh, response syndrome, and normally the patient is not yet infected. Then we're going to do another time point 
the day we suspect a sepsis, and then the last time point, the day 24 hours, the suspicion of sepsis. And then we're going to look at the differences between those time points to, to try to uh, evaluate the ability of this test to discriminate between non-infectious sears and, uh, and uh, sepsis in this uh, specific population. And uh, as a secondary objective, we're going to look at the potential impact of this test in terms of introduction of uh, antimicrobial uh, therapy. So I'm fully open to, to questions uh, at the end of the, the last presentation. Uh, and uh, again, I would like to thank the organizer for their invitations. Thank you very much, Dr. Dupré. And we go to the third and last speak, Dr. José Garnacho Montero, who is director of the intensive care clinical unit in the University Hospital Virgen Macarena in Sevilla, Spain. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for, to the Biocartis team for inviting me to uh, this interesting uh, session. Uh, today, as you know, we are all celebrating the, the World Sepsis Day, so I think it's a very good day to talk about sepsis, about the importance of sepsis in modern medicine, in many different types of patients, uh, like parents' patients, as has been previously discussed, or immunosuppressed patients, patients with neutropenia, or, any kind of patient and uh, I'm the last speaker so my uh, introduction will be very very short because I as I suppose my the previous speaker has uh, have explained the, the this technology uh, uh, septicide uh, and uh, just to a slide to uh, focus on uh, uh, the importance of, of sepsis uh, everybody knows that sepsis is the dysregulation of the uh, host response to an infection uh, leading to uh, life threatening organ dysfunction in, man, in many cases many cases uh, sepsis uh, kills sepsis uh, is associated with a very high uh, mortality or um, uh, morbidity not only mortality but patients with sepsis develop uh, failure of different organs sometimes of them, these organs uh, do not recover properly after uh, sepsis and um, uh, many patients with sepsis have uh, prolonged hospitalization in the ICU and in the hospital with a high economic uh, burden. Um, of course, everybody knows that sepsis is the dysregulation of the immune response to uh, an infection uh, agents, agent, uh, but many times the uh, diagnosis of the underlying infection is very difficult because uh, many other uh, insults can uh, present in a very similar way, so it's very difficult sometimes to know if the patient has an insult secondary to an uh, infection, in this case we are talking about sepsis, or if the patient has other type of inflammatory uh, in, uh, response. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, there are many different sources of, of sepsis, but of course in the ICU, I think that everybody agrees that uh, lung infection, pneumonia, uh, blood stream infection and abdominal sepsis are the three more frequent uh, focus on, on, on sepsis, or, although everybody knows that uh, many other focus can uh, be the, the source of, of, of sepsis. And it is essential to uh, the, the isolation of the different uh, pathogen causing the sepsis, but it is not uh, done in the first uh, hours, and many times it takes two, three, or four days uh, to know the pathogen that is causing the, the sepsis. It is true that very recently a uh, PCR-based uh, automatic uh, system has been uh, developed uh, to identify uh, many pathogens, but in my opinion this uh, system is very interesting because sometimes, or in, in many of them, uh, we can also have some uh, uh, resistant markers, but uh, this uh, uh, new technology, uh, PCR-based, has uh, two major uh, problems, in my opinion. First, is that not all pathogens are included, so you can uh, rule out the presence of 20, 25 pathogens, but uh, can be caused by other type of bacteria or, or, or fungi that are not included in, in this panel. And the second is that the majority, not all, but the majority of this panel are done in are carried out in, in, in blood. And we have many septic patients, patients that die in septic shock without uh, concomitant bacteremia or without concomitant fungemia. So uh, only approximately one third of the patient with sepsis and septic shock uh, develop bacteremia. So uh, 
you can have a patient without uh, the presence of viable uh, bacteria in, in, in blood, but uh, with a septic shell. So uh, for this uh, reason, I think, or for these two reasons, I think that we need another approach, like the approach that uh, septicide uh, provide, uh, provides. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we can ha have a patient without sepsis, uh, if, but we are not, if we are not sure that the patient has an insult uh, not related to an infection, we treat with antibiotics. In the ICU, all, 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 almost always we use broad spectrum antibiotics, at least empirically, and the unnecessary use of these broad spectrum antibiotics is uh, may lead to very serious uh, side effects, especially not only to the patient, that all antibiotics uh, uh, can have a, a side effect, but uh, serious uh, impact on the ecology of, of, of the unit, on the ecology of the of the hospital, and this is a very serious problem, especially in this area of multidrug uh, resistance. So, uh, a rapid biomarker, a point of care biomarker, uh, to identify if, the, if this is inflammatory response is secondary to an infection is a very interesting approach. And uh, of course, this is what we are to, we are talking today with the uh, septicide. I will present you two clinical cases. The first case is a, a male, 63 years old. Uh, his medical history, uh, uh, in his medical history, he has the, the diabetes mellitus, a non-dialysis chronic uh, uh, kidney disease. The patient was admitted uh, three uh, weeks of new admission uh, that I will be, uh, explain uh, later on and the patient was uh, uh, admitted to the ICU uh, for a bilateral SARS-CoV-2 uh, pneumonia in a critical condition. The patient required uh, immediate intubation when the patient was admitted to the, to the ICU and with the development of a very serious ARDS uh, with prone uh, sessions, uh, uh, the patient developed an acute renal failure requiring continuous renal replacement therapy and many uh, different uh, uh, infection complications in the ICU. In fact, the patient was in the, in the ICU, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, for 78 uh, days. And the patient developed these three, four episodes of sepsis and septic shock, uh, and primary bacteremia, uh, secondary to a, a uh, methicillin susceptible staph aureus, uh, uh, primary bacteremia uh, secondary to uh, enterococcus uh, physium, and two episodes of ventilator associated pneumonia. The, the first of them was uh, uh, the pathogen isolated was enterobacter cloacae, and the second a multidrug resistant uh, pseudomonas inertia. But after all these complications, the patient recovery, the, the tracheostomy tube. Uh, was removed and the patient was transferred to the to the general ward after 78 days in the ICU, as I mentioned uh, before. The patient was uh, breathing spontaneously with a normal renal function without requirement or no, almost normal because the patient had a previous renal defunction, but no need of renal replacement uh, therapy. But uh, after five days in the in the general ward, the patient developed uh, uh, dyspnea, developed uh, uh, with an uh, uh, increment of the respiratory work with prudent spiritu and uh, low-grade uh, fever. And two days later, the patient uh, de deteriorated and our colleagues in the general world require our uh, assistance. And the patient was transferred immediately to the, to the ICU in a severe respiratory distress and require uh, mechanical ventilation, intubation and, and, and mechanical ventilation. This is the X-ray just before uh, intubation, as you can see the Apache bilateral um, uh, infiltrates in, in both uh, lines with uh, peripheral uh, predominance. And uh, in this situation, the patient was uh, intubated for a severe respiratory uh, distress. When the patient was intubated, the, uh, the secretions were clearly uh, purulent, the patient was in shock and a soft score of, of eight points and no leukocytosis, although uh, the eutrophil uh, count was 89%. Uh, and in this situation, of course, a uh, broad spectrum antibiotic was started. We removed central venous catheter uh, and a new catheter was in inserted. And the septicide rapid test, uh, the, uh, the result was 3.7 in one, one, so very low probability of, of sepsis. 
so uh, the patient improved uh, uh, with uh, negative uh, fluid balance and antibiotics uh, were, were stopped on, on day two because we considered that the patient uh, with the clinical exploration with all the complementary data and of course with the aid of septicide, uh, the patient had uh, not an uh, infection and uh, it was confirmed because uh, blood culture and tracheal aspirate were negative. The patient improved. Uh, mechanical ventilation could be uh, retried uh, four days later and the patient was transferred again to the uh, general ward and uh, we did not use antibiotics during this uh, second uh, stay in the uh, intensive care unit. Uh, the second case is a different case. This is a male, 79 years old. Uh, the medical history was uh, uh, the patient had a diabetes mellitus, COPD, and an endoscopy devolability sigmoid bolus on June 21, approximately. Uh, approximately six months before the, the admission to the ICU, and the patient was diagnosed with a delicose sigma due to chronic uh, constipation. The patient had a severe COPD and uh, with uh, dyspnea, but the clinical patient in this case uh, began uh, two, three days earlier than the admission to the ICU with the uh, worsening of dyspnea, with cough and the patient was admitted to a, a peripheral hospital with very low level of concept, PO, P, uh, arterial PCO2 uh, 90 with a um, low pH, and the patient was uh, immediately intubated in the situation of uh, severe chronic uh, or, uh, respiratory insufficiency uh, uh, with uh, hypercardia. In that case, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, test was negative, but the influenza A uh, uh, PCR test was positive, so the patient was uh, transferred to our ICU with the diagnosis of uh, the compensation of a COPD uh, with a uh, viral infection. In this case, uh, uh, infection caused by uh, influenza. A. This is the the X-ray of the of the patient when the patient was admitted to, to the ICU. Uh, as you can see, there was a uh, this. Uh, uh, Opacity in the low uh, uh, right uh, lobe, and uh, no nothing uh, uh, alarming in the abdomen, as uh, you can see at least initially. But uh, uh, the patient was uh, in a critical condition with uh, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. The patient required no free. The sofa core was uh, nine point with leukocytosis. Uh, and the patient was treated as a uh, uh, possible um, uh, uh, community acquired pneumonia, at least with uh, influenza A and probably with other pathogens, although the urinary antigen 10, Legionella and Stephocococcal pneumonia were uh, negative. So the patient was treated initially with Oseltamivir uh, plus septicide plus uh, claritromycin. The septicide rapid was 7.7 .7 in, in band uh, 4, as it was explained uh, previously, and I will show you another slide uh, late, uh, later on. And the, the, the abdomen was not normal, very bulky abdomen. Also, curiously, the family did not find this abdomen very different from the abdomen that the patient had uh, normally because this history of glico uh, sigma. So, in that case, uh, we performed a, a CT scan because there was something. Um, more than a, than a simple quote by quote uh, influenza A, a and uh, as you I will show in the in the next slide the result of the CT scan this is to explain that above 7.4 uh, the patient has 7.7 .7, it's a high risk of sepsis and this is the pneumoperitoneum that, that the patient had and uh, not uh, uh, seen previously in the in the thorax X-ray and the patient was taken to uh, the to the OR, we initiated in that case uh, people that seen uh, taxobatan for the uh, suspicion of, uh, of uh, um, bowel perforation. In fact, a gastric perforation was observed in, in the OR. The blood culture were negative, and uh, the peritoneal fluid uh, were positive for these two uh, uh, streptococcus, as you can see in this slide. Yeah, I insist that the blood culture, that the patient had a, a septic shock. Uh, were uh, negative, that is seen in approximately two thirds of the patient with sepsis and, and septic shock. 
So uh, my take on messenger is that sepsis is sometimes a difficult diagnosis, sometimes it's very clear, but in other situations it's very difficult. The delay initiation of an effective treatment, uh, including resuscitation, source control, and adequate antimicrobial therapy, uh, is associated with a very high mortality rate. Sepsis site technology does not focus on the, for the identification of the, of the pathogen, but rather on the detection of the uh, dysregulated host immune response. Uh, the results are available in less than 90 minutes. In fact, the test uh, needs only 70 uh, minutes. And uh, the differentiation of stress from uh, infection negative systemic inflammation may help clinicians to confirm uh, uh, doubtful cases of, of patient and to stop antibiotics as we did in the first case in patients without an underlying uh, infection. In our experience, I think this is very interesting. Uh, uh, septicide works properly even if the patient had had previously, in the previous weeks, several episodes of, of sepsis and septic shock, as I showed you in the first uh, uh, patient, the patient that had the previous diameter with a uh, sars cov 2 uh, uh, pneumonia. Um, of course, uh, well-designed clinical studies are clearly required to demonstrate the clinical utility of this uh, new technology. Thank you very much for your attention and ready to respond to your uh, questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Garamacho. And I propose that all three speakers open the video so that we can start the Q&A session. And I see some questions coming in. Um, so one of the first questions for Dr. Bas, do you currently use the test routinely? We don't hear you. <laughs> yes. Sorry, not at this time because it's uh, actually in evaluation in our uh, hospital because it's perhaps a bit early. As uh, told Dr. Garnacho, uh, it's important to have uh, studies which are well designed in order to be sure that we can stop on teleprobiotics without uh, any risk for patients. But well. Thank you. Then a second question to Dr. Dupre. Do you see other patients than Burns for who the test could be useful? Um, I think there are many situations uh, where this test could be interesting. When you when you have uh, an inflammation of an, from a non-infectious uh, origin, sometimes polytrauma patients uh, have uh, sears uh, in the days after the trauma that can mimic sepsis. Can be interesting. It can be interesting in a febrile neutropenia, as presented by Dr. Uh, Vass. Uh, even if I, I wouldn't put it uh, at the same uh, at the same level, I think there are we have to differentiate uh, patient in shock with uh, organ failures and patient with a suspicion of sepsis but without organ failure. And uh, and I think it would be very interesting in uh, in the first case he presented. But in the first situation, when the patient I, uh, uh, had only a febrile neutropenia, but without any any uh, any organ failure, because in this case probably we put antibiotics in some patient that would don't don't, don't need uh, antibiotics. But in the when afterward, when the patient arrives uh, with a febrile neutropenia and uh, hypotension, anuria, in this case. As an intensivist, even if you give me a negative test that tells me, no, this patient uh, is not septic, it will be very difficult for me not to put antibiotic in this patient. Yes, it was so, a positive control we used in order to be <laughs> sure that it was very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, so I don't know if I answered the question, but I, I think it's very important to 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 know which population we are talking about. But uh, yes, it's, it's very interesting. Thank you. And I see another question to Dr. Garnacho. Uh, it's a specific question on case one that you presented. If you also consider to not start the broad spectrum antibiotics if the score is in band one. Okay, I think that uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Depre mentioned before, we use antibiotics, we won't have any doubt because we have to be very, very sure that the patient uh, doesn't have a septic shock or because it is very serious if you don't treat an anti with antibiotics a patient with a severe infection with an infection that is causing a, a septic shock. So I think that 
as I said in my last slide, we need a, a well designed study to, to be sure that this test works and that we can uh, stop antibiotic uh, in the first hours uh, with a um, patient in, in band one. So I think that uh, in that in this case, we had the, the, the aid of this test and we stopped antibiotic two days uh, later because uh, we had other uh, laboratory tests, the evolution of the patient, the X-ray. Uh, so I think that we, uh, uh, we did this, uh, decision not only based on uh, the safety side because we are now uh, testing this, this this technology but of course it was of a great help to to us to stop antibiotic but i think that our philosophy that we uh, we uh, we like to stop antibiotic as soon as possible of course because everybody knows that problem spectral antibiotic may cause uh, uh, side effects to our patient and to the ecology of the hospital but we have to be sure that we don't uh, jeopardize the patients, stop the uh, antibiotics uh, uh, very early if the patient has an infection. So I think that uh, probably with new uh, studies, we will have more information about the, the use of these tests in the uh, in different clinical situations. Okay, thank you. Maybe one last question, also looking at the time for Dr. Depré. Will you have the test done close to the burn units? And how fast will you then have the results available? Yeah, we're gonna perform it uh, at the bench, uh, at, the, at the bedside. We have the, the machine in the in the unit. So we will do it uh, ourselves. And uh, we have the result, as uh, Professor Vas said, uh, in one hour, you have the result. So it's, it's very interesting. So I will be happy, happy to present the result uh, in the next month, I hope. Okay, thanks a lot. Do you still have questions for the other speakers? You sell the speakers? If not, then I think we can close the session. And I want to again repeat my thank you to the speakers for preparing this very exciting topics today. And also big thank you to all the people uh, in the audience. And I look forward to organize uh, our next webinar on Septicide Rapid soon. Wish you a very nice rest of the day. And hope to speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. -bye. Thank you.